Theater of the Mind. Ten years. Jesus, how the hell did that happen? When this idiocy started, I figured we'd stretch it out for a year, maybe two if it took off. And yeah, we killed the show several times, but like Jason, Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger, Shingles, genital herpes, we keep coming back. Some of our segments may have been hit or miss, but our core show has held on and our fan base, whatever size it might be, has remained loyal and hungry for more Hauntcast. I say with all sincerity, there's something deeply and seriously wrong with you. But I don't judge. At any rate, I must say that one of the things I was thankful for this Thanksgiving was the fact that so many people are so tragically and sadly lacking in good taste that we still have an audience for this show. Thanksgiving was a good day. In spite of recently lost loved ones and some tragically difficult times for some in the family, there was no mistaking the fact that in spite of adversity, we all had a lot to be thankful for. I, for one, am grateful to simply be alive. Not just alive, but relatively unscathed after suffering not just one, but two strokes a mere six months ago. A lot of people don't get off nearly so easily. As one of my doctors rather bluntly told me, you don't know how emotionally attached you are to wiping your own ass until you can't anymore. I know, TMI, but this is Hauntcast, you knew what you were getting into. Anyway, arguably I'm in better health now than I've been in several years, and for that I am immensely grateful. Also, Thanksgiving Day was a just plain nice day, a rare clear day of relative warmth and sunshine after a long run of cold, cloudy gloom. It was good to see the sun again, and then of course the very next day was a return to the dismal murkiness. At least it was still a fairly decent temperature, so I donned a jacket and spent some time sitting outside. It was a time for some quiet, sober reflection, primarily because the scenery just seemed conducive to it. The wet, gray neighborhood around me just had a lifeless cast to it, as if the rain had washed much of the pigment out of the world and sent it flowing down into the storm drains. It got me thinking about how the weather and shortened daylight hours affect people's moods, I know that seasonal affective disorder has a real scientific basis in neurology related to the amount of sunlight received, but I think part of the depression people suffer in the late fall and winter months just comes from the world looking so damn gray and washed out all the time. It's nice when people start putting their Christmas lights up, at least it's a way of restoring a little color to the scene. As I previously stated back in our first season of Hauntcast, I think it was episode 5, Colors can have a big effect on emotional states and can be a valuable tool in telling a visual story. I had planned on revisiting the topic of color this season and originally planned to address it in one of the later shows, but the more I thought about it, the more I felt that it might be something to consider in the earliest phases of the haunt plan. After all, colors have an emotional effect, and a haunt relies upon emotional manipulation to tell its story, so why not keep the color scheme in mind when creating the initial design? Color also happens to be one of the most practical tools in the Haunter's Toolbox for a variety of utilitarian applications. So, let us wax chromatic and take another look at ways to add a little color to our theaters of the mind. Color schemes play a big part in establishing the emotional tone and setting of the haunt. The deadness of winter, with its largely monochrome vistas of white and gray, sets a tone of bleakness. The mildew and water stains of old plaster walls and ceilings gives the sense of decay and disintegration, while the molds and lichens on rotting trees make it look even more sickly and blighted. Different hues and shades of the same color also give much different impressions. I remember the clown haunt that we did for the Blackford haunt years ago. We used plenty of regular circus colors, mostly red and white, for the inside walls, but I had different ideas for my character. Disturbo the Clown, who I based on carnies as opposed to circus clowns, needed to look basically dirty and gross, someone unkempt and nasty that you would never want going near your kids. Along with my greasy and stained bib overalls, I put big circus polka dots on the thermal t-shirt I wore, but the red, green, and yellow dots were not the bold primary colors associated with the circus. The green spots looked like mold, the red was the color of dried blood, and the yellow looked like sweat stains so of course the two biggest yellow spots were under the arms, and I roughly sponged the dye on the shirt so they looked more like stains than polka dots. It really helped hammer home the idea that this was one nasty, seedy character. When doing your dyeing and painting, have some fun with tweaking the tints to push an impression you want to give. In addition to the basic choice of hues, also think in terms of saturation of color. Color can be bold and, well, colorful, or it can be diluted, pale, and toned down. 
This is especially important with choosing the relative colors of backgrounds versus focal elements like props and characters. A haunter's budget may not be conducive to large quantities of paint, or you may not be too keen on painting a wall of your house, but the ultimate cheap source of painting is light. Put a blue gel on a floodlight, and bam, you got a blue wall. If that flood happens to also illuminate a prop, however, that prop is going to lose its own color scheme and also appear monochromatic. Think about it. When we paint something a certain color, the color that we see is actually the color of the light that's reflected back to our eyes. White light is actually a mixture of all colors combined, so certain pigments will absorb some of the colors in that light and reflect others back to us. If you illuminate a prop with a light of a specific color, it's going to reflect that color back to you. It can't reflect a color that isn't shining on it. So when a prop is lit with colored light, you'll have a monochromatic prop. If this is not the effect you're looking for, make sure the colored flood you're using only lights the background and use regular white light for the props. In scene painting and lighting, contrast is king. Remember that the eye is instantly drawn to anything that stands out from its surroundings, either due to motion or coloration. A desaturated, relatively monochromatic background helps the focal elements stand out better. Blood and guts, alien growths, mutant plants, and the like are going to visually pop and be much more dramatic if they're seen against a dull or washed out background. This is also true, albeit to a lesser extent, if said growth is dull and gray up against a colorful background. Of course, this also holds true for dark objects against a light background or vice versa. Anything that doesn't look like it belongs with its surroundings is going to be noticed more and draw people's curiosity. The more bold the contrast, the more dramatic the effect. In another episode of the show, I talked about layout and how a scene can be maximized by leading and directing the audience's attention through placement of the elements of that scene. Color can be an integral part of that approach. For example, in a room with cream-colored walls and light brown furniture, a bright red blood stain is instantly going to grab people's attention and cause them to look directly at it. If it's a single stain, they'll be focused momentarily on that detail. If there are several scattered stains, their attention will be less focused and they'll tend to look around more. This is important to remember if your placement of that stain is done to direct their attention towards something you want them to see or, conversely, misdirect them from something you don't want them to see, like an approaching scare actor or jump scare prop. That loss of focus will also happen if the color scheme of the irrelevant details of the room are too bold. The busier the color scheme of the surroundings are, the less likely that that stain would stand out. Basically, if you're trying to manipulate and direct people's attention, the target elements of the scene should be boldly colored and the surroundings should be muted or uniformly colored in a different hue to make them far less eye-catching. This is also the principle behind camouflage. The more an object resembles its surroundings, the less likely an observer will notice it. It just blends in and won't even be noticed if something far more attention-grabbing is present nearby. It doesn't necessarily have to be totally concealed or made invisible, just less interesting. For example, in a graveyard scene, the typical bright orange extension cord is going to stand out like a sore thumb and cause people to look right at it, even if only for a moment, and for that moment, they're pulled out of the illusion. If, however, it's a green cord, maybe even one that's been sponged and splattered with gray and black paint, it doesn't stand out as much, and people will tend to ignore it as irrelevant, even if they actually see it. Author Douglas Adams played with this idea in his Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series when he described the inability of any race in the universe to successfully create invisibility. The breakthrough came when a great scientist invented the SEP field, or someone else's problem. By generating a someone else's problem field around an object, people would simply not care enough to notice it, and that object would be completely ignored, and thus might as well be actually invisible. While such a wondrous technological advancement as the SEP generator may be out of our realm, it's amazing how close a little paint can come to achieving basically the same effect. And of course, the aforementioned scare actor or jump scare prop can be concealed in the same manner to help preserve the element of surprise. An often mismanaged aspect of coloring the haunt is level of detail. Whether we're making props, masks, or haunt maze walls, as creators, we tend to fall in love with our creations and put a great amount of detailing into them. While this can result in some awesome pieces of artwork that make for great pictures and win plenty of prizes in online forum prop building contests, the cold brutal truth is that it can actually make them less effective in the haunt itself. 
The reason for this is simply the conditions under which they will be seen. The visual conditions in a haunt tend to be overall dimly lit with patchy, varied directional lighting and a lot of motion. Many of the visual elements will be at a distance, maybe only 8 feet or so, but when seen fleetingly under these suboptimal lighting conditions, that's enough to obscure a lot of detail. Unless something is lit by a good amount of ambient white light and the observer has time to get a really good look at it, much of the visual detail is lost. Even worse, if it's visually busy with a lot of fine detailing, those details tend to blur together into a kind of mush. To get a good idea of the right way to paint and do makeup and masks for a haunt, study stage makeup. If you've ever acted on stage or been backstage to see the actors when they're made up, they don't look natural at all. And if it's a special effect or character makeup, backstage, they look like they're doing kabuki theater. Stage lighting and distance would wash out the detail of an ordinary up-close and personal makeup job. The shadows and shades of stage makeup are simplified, bold, and exaggerated, with no blending. The haunt, even though it is up close and personal, needs the same treatment, both for its actors and its props and scenery, to look realistic under the unrealistic conditions. A lot of the silicone masks I see at Transworld are awesome to behold, but many of them look like they're created to be viewed on a mask stand and not in a haunt. They're just too detailed. In the dim, chaotic conditions of the haunted attraction, the guests would simply not be able to make out the details of the mask, and they may not even necessarily know what they're seeing. Simple is actually better. One of my favorite masks is a face with bared teeth, no hair, and no eyes. In an ambush square, the only details of the head that people will see are the mouth and the outline of the head. The absence of the eyes is not only horrific and disturbing, but it's so simple in its lack of detail that people will instantly be able to process what they're seeing, and the freak factor will hit them full force. In coming up with an overall color scheme for the haunt, it behooves the haunter to first just think about the theme, and if there is one, the backstory of the haunt. What story are you trying to tell? Is it what I like to call Haunts 57 flavored, a random collection of scary scenes related only by the fact that they're spooky or scary or otherwise Halloweenish? Or is there a general theme connecting everything, like Universal Studios monsters or vampires or clowns? Or is there a specific story with every scene related and focused on a main character or event? After you have that determined, the next step is deciding what you want the audience to feel and experience as they go through. Yeah, I know, fear. But that's being vague. Be specific. What precise emotions are you going for? Horror? Terror? Dread and paranoia? Revulsion and atrocity? Fun and humor? If it's a walkthrough with several scenes, you may be looking for a combination of different emotions distributed throughout. Your color schemes should work together with your choices of music and sound effects to set a mood that works with the scares you have planned in each scene. Some colors are happy and joyous. Some are gloomy and somber. Some are sickly and rotten or jarring or horrifying or whatever. For example, the palette used in the Saw movies was bleak, decayed, and industrial looking pushing the feeling that the characters were trapped in a forgotten place, adding to the hopelessness and despair. Similar color plans were seen in the Silent Hill film, with the added rust-and-blood motif making the monstrous world seem diseased and corrupted, a hellish world of putrefaction and pestilence. Unless you're running a large pro haunt, you don't have much time to tell your story, so the better you can coordinate your sights and sounds and scares to hammer home your specific desire and impressions, the more entertaining and memorable the haunt will be for your guests. Scene painting, prop painting, makeup, and lighting are a few important challenges that the haunter takes on in the design process, but they're all really just different facets of one major principle, color. It's powerful stuff. It reveals and it conceals. It conveys emotion. It directs our attention. It helps tell a story. So in this early phase of the haunt season, I know you tell your spouse that you're taking November and December off and not doing anything haunt related, but don't lie. You're thinking about it and making plans. Let the color scheme evolve alongside your theme and story. It may just open up some new ideas along the way. From the bottom of my blackened little heart, I extend my sincere thanks to all of you for listening to our foolishness over these past 10 years, and look forward to more shows in the future for however long we keep doing it. If it's all tied into Chris's ego and craving for attention, we may be at it well into our retirement years. 
At any rate, I thank you for the many kind words and compliments, and I take delight in the confirmation that my rambling and geekery have prompted some of you to look at your haunts in new ways and come up with new ideas of your own. Have a peaceful and happy holiday season, and of course, keep that ghost light burning. From the Theater of the Mind, I'm Revenant, and you're listening to Hauntcast. I'm going now. Heaven help you. Please like and follow the podcast. Stalk us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Links in the description. And help us by sharing Hauntcast with all your haunted Halloween brethren. Until next time, stay scary. (laughs) 